everybody. So yeah, my name is uh, Richard Freeman. Uh, so I have a PhD in machine learning. And um, I did that back in the days when data science wasn't sexy. So I finished around 2004. Then I had a long, <laughs> then I had a career around um, being a, like, a technical consultant at Capgemini. So I've got this industry experience also. Joined Michael Page for three years. And I've been at Just Giving actually for five and a half years. Um, and essentially, let's have a show of hands, actually. How many people have heard of Just Giving before? Wow, <laughs> that's amazing. Thank you, guys. How many fundraisers in the room? Yeah, pretty good. Good ratio. <laughs> um, so today, we're going to be talking about part of the architecture that we're using in the data science team. Um, specifically, so we've got the Raven data science platform that we created. This is for doing everything from training, from ingesting data at scale. But really, today we're going to talk about Koala, which is our web analytics product that we've created in-house. And it's using serverless technology. So the title you can see up there is around the architecture patterns for implementing serverless microservices architecture, which we're using. And also, we're going to be talking about stream processing. So something, hopefully by the end of the day, you'll be able to take this back and implement it also within your organizations. So just go back to like, the real time world. So there's been a survey recently from the Harvard Business Review. So the same one that says you know, that data science is the sexiest profession of the 21st century. Um, so they're saying, or people have admitted that they're not very good at real time interactions with the users. So remember the comments about the pop up in Expedia? Is that real in terms of number of hotels? So, there's many, many organizations that don't have this, and they admit it, that there's no real-time serving. In the last year, so this was 2018, they've increased the spend. So this is like the CIOs and, and various organizations that got surveyed. They've increased the spend by 70%. In the next two years, again, they're planning to implement real-time analytics. So this is really around how, as the user's interacting with the website, with the app, with your store, you want to actually you know, interact with them directly, make recommendations in product, for example, or serve some analytics back to the users. So there's a massive demand almost for that. And people are noticing, again, if you're not doing that, you might be left behind the competition. So just giving, well, most of you know us, uh, we are a tech for good platform for event-based fundraising and crowdfunding. We were founded by two ladies, Anne-Marie and Zareen, in around year 2000. And we took 17 years to exit. <laughs> So maybe some of you don't know, we've got acquired by Blackboard. Blackboard is a company that operates only in the nonprofit sector. So they only work with universities, school software, and also in the nonprofit. So they're like a cloud provider for software. And they also do analytics and have a data science capability. So they acquired us. We've raised over $5 billion in donations. So if you think about that massive amount of you know, money going to good causes, that's been done through our platform. We've got 26 million registered users on the platform in almost all the countries around. And our motto is to ensure that no great cause goes unfunded. Now, how do you do this? In our team, we use data science. So it's about serving content that's relevant, that's interesting, and also targeting people that are, um, for example, people you may know and you're interested in their activity. So you've probably seen the feed. This is powered by data science. So we've got various, these are like cards. This is like people we may know, which is powered by the graph. We've got various recommendations that happen. This is the crowdfunding or the fundraising pages you've also seen. So here we've got um, Sophie running a half marathon for the Mind charity. And there's various elements in here that are actually powered by data science also. So we've got the recommended target value up there. That's that essentially by providing a target when you're fundraising, that raises more. So as you're creating a fundraising page, um, that's prompted to you, and actually that's been tested. We have the give graph, which has half a billion edges and 98 million nodes. So again, this is based on donation data and based on the charity description data. So we're not going out to Facebook and pulling in data. This is really donation data. Um, so this is all powered by the graph. Unfortunately, it's not today's topic. I spoke about this on Tuesday already at a conference. So today's topic, we're talking about the real-time element, the serverless, how you can implement this. This is one of the key streams that actually feeds our data science. So that's why I really want to talk about it. Uh, we're going to be talking about, so there's probably some developers in the room, so you've probably heard of CQRS. So this is one of the patterns where you're separating the right concern from the read concern. 
And essentially, I want to give the, the detailed architecture around how we do this at Just Giving. So how we do web analytics capture at scale in-house, how we can do the stream processing in a serverless way, how we can create a metrics API that's fully serverless, how we can store that data back into S3 in near, well, 15 minutes intervals, and then how we do the monitoring. So I'm going to show you an example of that. So first, microservices. So um, before the microservices, there used to be a multi-tier architecture. So when I started off at Capgemini, we used to have presentation layer, the business layer, and then the data layer. And then you would release almost one layer at a time. You would have one like app server, web server for each layer. Um, so obviously, it's a slow release process. It would take very long. That was kind of the monolithic model. Along came service-orientated architecture, which used WSDL, so it used REST interfaces. Um, they were typically SOAP-based, XML. And then we had event-driven architecture. So essentially, everything that happens in your organization is an event. So in just giving, a donation is made, that's an event. Someone views a page, that's an event. So every interaction within the organization is an event. And then you have event listeners, so that's event-driven architecture. Domain-driven design is also part of the foundation of microservices. So these two are part of the foundation. And essentially, domain-driven design is where you have a bounded context. So within this context, you deal with anything, for example, around the customer support. You would have like all the services are linked together. And you'd almost have a team working together with what they call a ubiquitous language model. So as in they understand each other when they work together. Um, in 2011, the term microservices came out. And it's really Netflix and Adrian Crockcroft that came up with the the web scale version of microservices at Netflix. And I think when he started off, I think it was 2009, they said, you're crazy, it's never going to work. In 2010, they, he, they said, yeah, it looks interesting, but it's, it's probably not something that will work you know, uh, in our organization. And then later on, it was more about, yeah, Netflix can do it, we can't do it. And then eventually, it was like more widely adopted. So I think any innovation happens in that way. They think you're crazy at the beginning. Um, and then they try and discredit you, maybe. And then eventually, you know, you're actually the norm. And eventually, enterprise IT sort of catches up, like, you know, four, four years later, maybe. So that's sort of the origin of the microservices. What does a microservice look like exactly? So it's based on a service. We've got an API, which is a REST interface. Um, we have the concept of a dumb pipeline. So actually, the microservice itself is smart in that it knows how to call the other services, how to route messaging. Um, in the old days, they used to have enterprise service buses, which still exist, so those do the routing and transformation. When you've got two services integrated, you would have a bus in between. Now it's more about dumb pipeline, um, smart endpoints. Single responsibility, so one service does one thing and it does it very well. And then we have this bounded context I talked about, so where you can group the services together. So how does it look like? They usually have this sort of shape. You've got a REST endpoint there. You've got a data store that's linked to the service. And then you've got like an event that would be published, so you can have other listeners. So essentially, there's patterns. So what are the patterns? Patterns are essentially an abstraction of a solved problem. So imagine you've got um, something that's been solved by one team. Then you can actually reuse the same method that they used, and that's a pattern. So it has a common language, and it's a solution that's something that others have faced in the past that you can actually reuse. And you've got to think about microservices. They never exist in isolation. They're always integrated together. So it's very important to understand the, the pattern and the common language. And it saves you time. And you, you gain the, the, the wisdom of the crowd almost from you know, reusing patterns. So this is the patterns that uh, are taken from Chris Richardson's site. So you can go to microservices.io. Sam Newman's also like the other book that I recommend if you're looking at microservices. Um, the main problem I found was um, this was still in being written at the time, but essentially it's focused very much around virtual machines and using Docker containers. So it's a different paradigm almost than the serverless computing, where a lot of these patterns can be reused. Uh, it's also assuming that you have a big DevOps team to create your CI CD pipeline to do networking, for example, for the Docker, to do the deployments, and to do all this monitoring. So that assumes that you've got uh, this big team. Um, so I'm going to talk about serverless and how we do those patterns in, in a minute. But let's talk about the CQRS pattern, which is um, probably a few of you know about. So you've got a front end, so that could be the, um, you know, the UI. We've got an API gateway. So 
that executes a command, so it could be post, put, delete. So you've got the command service there that then writes the message into the event store. You've got an event processor here, which processes that event. And this could be, there could be many listeners to this event store and writes it to a data store. And the idea is this is the right concern. Then you have some other service that is the query service to do the get, to get the data from here. So again, you could have many of these data stores, but that, that's what CQRS is essentially. Command query, responsibility, segregation. So you split write from read. And that allows you to scale out almost. Um, if you sacrifice a little bit of the eventual consistency here, then yeah, you can scale out almost. That's sort of what you do at web scale to serve data. So let's talk about the microservices patterns. So what is serverless first? So how, a show of hands, how many people have heard about serverless and lambdas? Yeah, good. So serverless is essentially you still have servers. It's just not, you're not managing them. You're not managing the security. You're not managing the scalability or the high availability. You're sort of configuring that and letting the cloud provider do that. So AWS was the first one with the Lambda functions. And you've got Azure functions, Google, and there's even Alibaba. So there's this functions as a service. So there's even other providers like GitLab. And yeah. Uh, so essentially, you can focus really on the business logic. So you don't have to care about the inbound integration. Um, you can configure security, and that's managed by the cloud provider. They're also scaling, highly available. And you pay per execution time also. So the idea is. Um, you would have the code um, executing for 10 seconds, for example, and you only pay for the 10 seconds. So Lambda functions, you pay per 100 milliseconds integrals. <clears throat> There's some drawbacks. So you've got a limited type of instances. So like for us, we're doing, when we're doing deep learning scoring, for example, we need a GPU, really. So the Lambdas don't support GPUs at the moment, and they've got a 15-minute duration limit. Um, there's also like a 50, 50 meg compressed custom libraries. So when you want to have models, um, the libraries that you need for the model scoring, then that, that becomes a bit more complex. So even like scikit-learn, getting it into a lambda, you can sort of do it, but it's, it's a bit trickier. OK, so let's talk about the uh, lambda functions. So most of you know this, but you've got different types of integration. You've got uh, a file gets dropped into S3 that gets, triggers a lambda. You've got the requests, which is like the endpoint I showed you earlier for CQRS. So you get request or post. So that triggers a lambda. You've also got the other types of things, which is like CloudWatch. So you could have error detections. Um, you've got SNS and cron events. And the interesting one for me, we're going to talk about more, is around the Amazon Kinesis streams, SQS and Dynamo. So this is a stream of data that will trigger a micro batch calling the lambda function. So they can be called async. But the green bit is the interesting bit, because that's built by Amazon. Um, and you don't need to build that anymore. The only bit you need to drop is your code. So here you get a JSON payload of the request, or the data, or the micro batch. And then you just process it here in whatever language you want. And you're responsible for the right bit. So that's one paradigm. The other type is event streaming. So for example, we're using Kinesis Streams. So we've got all the web traffic coming in. So we'd have several shards, and then each lander would process the shard, the data from a shard, and then you're responsible for the outbound integration. So there's a few data stores that are available, um, which are serverless. So we've got DynamoDB, which is highly scalable. It runs on SSDs. It's also got support for high availability, and it runs in memory if you want, so similar to a Redis cache. So again, that's something you can enable in front and without too much config. It's very simple and cost effective. So the new one that I've been testing also as part of my video course is Aurora Serverless. So it allows you to pay per request also. So the uh, previous one was NoSQL, Dynamo. So this you can write, you can do MySQL or PostgreSQL. So you can write your relational queries. You can do your joins, group buys very easily. It's fully managed again, highly available. You can have, um, I think it's 15 read replicas. So it's similar to the Aurora model. And you've got this pay per resource. So if you're not using it, it can go into pause mode where you're not paying. So it's got some benefits. Um, and here's like, I've taken all of the, uh, the patterns we talked about earlier. And essentially, um, I've looked at how you can create um, a serverless version of what's been done with microservice patterns. 
And if you want to find out how to do those, I've written two video courses you can look at, and I'm writing a book at the moment. So just giving, so what we've done. So we had Koala. Um, initially, we had a web analytics vendor that we were using for tracking the web analytics. And we needed the, the data was provided to us every hour. So this is the raw data, not the aggregates. It was quite difficult for the developers to implement. It was um, pretty expensive. So it's based on the number of events. And also, they add a, a margin on top. It also didn't support all the browsers. So we're missing out quite a bit of the web analytics activity. So then we decided to create our own um, web analytics library and package or application in-house, which is essentially we're getting the data in real time. So we're able to use that data in data science, again, for scoring or for real-time metrics. And again, the metrics are something we provide back to, um, to the fundraisers or the crowd funders. We've also got um, it's much easier to actually integrate and make use as, as a developer. So you've got real-time debug. It's a lot more cost-effective. So you know, any money saved from paying a vendor actually goes straight into the charities. So that's a good thing. And the raw data is also stored in S3. So, and that's the little koala there showing that actually we're keeping it all in-house, so we're not using any external vendors. So the koala likes to have a stream of data in-house. So it allows you to, um, we're going to talk about the architecture in the next slide, I think. But essentially, it allows you to actually keep it cheaper, but also you've got a lot more flexibility in terms of the data. So how do you do this? So we've got the web clients. We've got some back-end services, such as the financial services when you're making a donation. We've got the mobile app, and we've got the client browser. So essentially, it's doing an HTTP post here with a JSON payload into the API gateway. We use an IAM role to actually verify that you know, this API gateway is allowed to access Kinesis streams. So this is the first pattern where we're taking the full flow of the web analytics in just giving. So our 26 million registered users, the traffic from them, and it's going straight into Kinesis streams. Why do I like Kinesis streams? It supports 1,000 writes per second per shard. You need more capacity. You had 10 shards, you've got 10,000 writes per second. You know, so it's, it works out very cheap also. So that's, that's the first pattern to capture the data that you can actually use in-house if you want to now. Um, that integration is done by Amazon. This is like 100% managed. So this is a pay as you go. This is pay per shard, roughly. OK, so the next pattern. So we've got that data now in Kinesis Streams. <clears throat> so what you can do to actually analyze the data is to fit a lander straight onto the Kinesis Streams. You actually get a micro batch for each shard. So I'm assuming we have four shards here. So each shard supports 1,000 writes per second. Then you have one lander per shard, and you can actually process the data that way. And what we've done, so this is in an API we call the Magpie API, which exposes the page views and the shares per fundraising page and crowdfunding page. So we write this to DynamoDB, which is a table, which again is serverless. And this is the schema of the table. So I've written this. I've written lots of blog posts about this. I've presented this at reInvent in, in Vegas also. So we've got an event ID. So because it's no SQL, you've got to write it in a certain way you can create it fast. So that's like the page ID. And we've got the event date here. So it shows you the date in that format. And then we've got the count. So this allows you quickly to retrieve, for example, weeks of data, a specific week you know, based on the ID. So it uses what's known as a partition key. And this is the range. So you can do a greater than on that. This one has to be an exact condition. That's how Dynamo works. And the no SQL is similar. Um, I think most of them uh, work like that, unless you scan the whole table. So the beauty of Kinesis Streams is you can store the data for up to seven days or so. You can replay at any point in time. So if I want to replay from yesterday, I can do that and just replay the whole event. That's also a great way for performance testing. Again, I can replay the, the full web analytics load you know, a lot faster in a few hours. Um, replaying it through to test that it's all working. And also, you can scale the read and write on Amazon independently. The reads are cheaper than the writes. So you could have you know, maybe like 500 writes and then 1,000 reads or something like that. And you don't have to have 1,000, 1,000, which is really good. So now we've got that data in the table. So we've got that aggregate count table there like this. So how do we expose it to make it available to the front end or to other email clients, for example? 
Then same thing, you've got these front ends calling it. We do have um, an API gateway for that. So this is for consuming the, the data, which invokes a Lambda function, which then queries, it shapes the query from the, the rest, and then queries DynamoDB. And then you get the response back. And again, that can happen fairly quickly. This could be like a 20 milliseconds operation, totally serverless, something you can build today, you know, in a, in a couple of days, you can have this running at scale. Uh, and that is about 140 lines of code, like proper Python code written with classes, um, like a, with a Dynamo repo. So that's about it. And security is managed again by Amazon. So that works. So that's how you would get the metrics out that we've shown you here in this table. So it would come back out in a JSON format. <clears throat> so now that you have it in the stream, you also want to load it into other big data systems or you know, maybe into a data lake. So you can plug in Amazon Kinesis Streams into Kinesis Firehose, and that will buffer it up. And every 15 minutes, it will write it to S3. Um, and it also supports columnar formats, which allow you to query it a lot faster. So you've got, uh, if you want to keep it totally serverless, so you can spin up Athena, and then you can query the columnar data directly. What we do in data science, we actually bring it into Amazon Redshift, and we also have uh, Amazon EMR we're using. We run Apache Spark jobs. And this is where we plug in Python, R, SQL, various tools, and we we use some of that web analytics data to make predictions. We also take transactional data and some of the email data to do that. Uh, so this is part of the Raven platform. Um, so essentially, it's all down to how you persist that data also if you, if you want to analyze it as a batch. So that's something important to think about. So, and those are like the four different ways of doing that. Last one is observability. So there's various tools and um, applications that are built in AWS. So you've got CloudWatch, which does like the web logs, app logs. Um, you can also look at the API logs, which are quite interesting. So you can see uh, what payload has been called through the HTTP request in API Gateway. Um, you've got CloudTrail that shows you what's been happening, uh, how the services have been configured. And you've got X-Ray. So I just did an X-Ray last, last night. I was just doing some performance testing of, um, of an API I created. So this is, it generates this dynamically. This is a service map. So this is like to understand what is the latency, what are the bottlenecks in the system. So this is something, if you annotate your code correctly, it gets generated automatically for you. So you've got the API gateway we talked about earlier. That's the Lambda, and here's the Dynamo. Interesting thing for me, so I think I did, so I was using Locus, which is a Python tool. I was doing some performance testing. Um, so I was hitting it with about 1,000 users. I think it was about 400 requests per second, something like that. And you can see here, like, you know, that's the latency in milliseconds. So just to give you an idea for those who are maybe not as technical, so if you're doing front-end work, then, um, you know, when it's laggy and the interface is slow, that's because the underlying services are quite slow. So usually you want something under 500 milliseconds to actually, you know, show it back to the user very fast. You want something that's flashy and fast. So this is, like, a very important measure when you're looking at... Um, essentially the responsiveness of an interface or the responsiveness of other services. So again, it's how you, if you have many services calling each other, obviously that adds up each time on latency. So this is quite a cool tool. Annotate your code and you have that for free pretty much. So the map's generated, you don't need to draw it out. So what are the benefits of, uh, well, using service at just giving? We've managed to, I've shown you how to implement CQRS essentially in a serverless way. Um, we've also, I've explained a bit about the inbound integration. So the inbound integration for API Gateway, for Kinesis Streams, for Dynamo is actually built in for you. It's managed by you. So if you did this with a container or an EC2 machine, virtual machine, you would have to write that inbound integration. You would have to actually you know, ingest the data or do some polling, maintain the position. And it's the same with Kafka if you did that. Here it's actually just have a lander. You get a JSON micro, micro batch, and then you just process it in a for loop. You know, so it's very easy, that's built in. Uh, it's all auto-scaling. Security, again, is configured. So you can use SAM, which is like the, um, the CloudFormation template for simplifying that. Um, if we compare it to the previous Web Analytics product, which if you look at my old reInvent slides, you'll know who they are, um, it's about 10 times cheaper to use Koala to do this in-house, actually. 
um, than what we had before using paying a vendor product where we'd only get it in batches every hour. So now we, we've got the ability to actually process and to create those real-time dashboards. Um, yeah, it's real-time, it's pay as you go, and there's almost no ops. It's something that, you know, when we get viral events happening on the Just Giving platform, then it really does go viral, and then the ops teams need to look at other services, but Koala's the one that they don't even look at, you know, so it just copes with, scales out, we pay a bit more, um, so that's the beauty of it. Um, so what about the future? So. This was part of a, a hackathon we did in the past. <clears throat> so, so here we've got, this is why I would love to provide the fundraisers and crowd funders. So essentially we've got the page views for your page. Um, sorry, this is the donations. So if you click on donations there, you'd have the donations over time. And then if you took the action at the top on the slider, you would get this uplift. So this is part of the prediction. So this is something we didn't manage to do the full prediction, obviously, in this hackathon. But this is to give you an idea, essentially. We've got this mock-up here. And we'd have a list of suggestions, how you can raise more, how you can get more page views, and how you can get more shares. So if you click on that, you get a number of views, and then you get more shares. And that sort of gives you a time series prediction. And here we've got the, we'd have a real-time referrers also. So out of your page, you know, what are the main referrers? So this is very similar to what like Medium, the blogging site does. Um, so this is something I would like to provide um, to the fundraisers. Again, it's about empowering them, understanding, you know, how the traffic is coming in, what they can do to, to get it better. So it's like personalized per, per user. Again, this was a hackathon, so it's not, not on the roadmap, but you know, it's something I would like to have. So just to give you an idea of the future. Um, so you could use the same architecture that I've shown you to do this. So the Koala, the serverless patterns, and then you just do real-time inference on, the, on this data here. Cool. So today we talked about the microservices. I talked about how you can implement them, how, you can, how we've done it in Just Giving. So how we've done the, the capture, the processing, the API to expose that data back to the users, and how we can persist it, how we can observe it also. So I'd like to thank uh, Evo also. So he's like the co-creator with me on, um, on the Koala Web Analytics Library. So again, it's not like we're not talking hundreds of people. It's really me and him getting this rolled out, like coding, rolled out, convince all the other developers in-house you know, to adopt it versus using a, you know, a vendor package. Um, so yeah, I'd like to thank Evo a lot about that. And also the rest of the data science team. So again, it's not just about ingesting all the all this web analytics data. It's also about analyzing it, doing QA, you know, making um, predictions on that data. So there are quite a few people on the list. So especially Thomas and Sean, they did loads of work on Koala. And I'd also like to thank all the animals, including the Raven, <laughs> Raven platform, which is our big data platform, which runs around Redshift and EMR. So you've got the Koala, the Panda, and various other animals like Magpie, Kingfisher, and the Stork which are all like data science products, actually. We haven't, we've only talked about the first three, I think, publicly. OK, so yeah, if you want to find out more about the microservice patterns, how to do the serverless, I've got like all the source code. Some of the code is free on GitHub, so you can get that. Um, I've also got two courses that are available on Udemy, Safari, um, and there's a book on its way, so you know, that will be out shortly. Um, and really, our motto is to ensure that no good cause goes unfunded. So when I was presenting at the reInvent 2016, I was trying to push this concept of tech for good, um, you know, to encourage other people. So then people came back to me and they asked me, you know, how can we get involved in tech for good? So actually, I wrote a massive email to that person, and um, I wrote, yeah, I thought, you know, it'd be a shame. Let's put it as a blog. So I wrote a Medium blog post, um, which you can find on here. So this is how you can really make a difference. You know, just like two of you go and do some tech for good or do a hackathon with a charity, that will make a massive difference. So um, like I've, I've done a hackathon with the British Heart Foundation. Um, and then you know, that just makes a difference. That saves them money. You're saving lives. You're making a difference in the world with your technical skills. So I'd love if you can just take some of this serverless knowledge almost away and then you know, try and do some good. Um, yeah, these are my contact details. So ask me any questions about this um, now or after. All right. Thank you very much for your attention.
Hi. Uh, in the context of Bender Lock-in, mm -hmm. um, how difficult would it be to migrate, for example, Koala off of AWS and onto another um, uh, platform? Uh, again, it's down to the code. So, for example, you could use the um, the one I know about is Azure. So they've got a managed API. So that that would be possible, but you'd have to um, you'd have to use like the Event Hub and then fit in option there. So it is possible. Um, again, we could. Um, so if Eva was here, we'd say, yeah, I can push the traffic to Google Analytics to um, to any other vendor almost to Segment to Mix Panel. Uh, so we've used Mixpanel, we've used Kissmetrics in the past, and we've also taken the, the best that they have, almost, and implemented it in Koala ourselves. Um, so not that hard, I'd say. We can redirect the traffic how we want to. So we are using Google Analytics at the moment, but it's sampled data. Um, sampled data is not very useful, so you need to get the raw data um, through BigQuery, and then you know there's a cost. Um, so our Koala is um, a lot more accurate and we can point the traffic where we want to, basically, to answer your question. Hi. Um, <clears throat> great talk. Thanks very much. Thank you. Um, I, I was struck by the fact that you keep on referring to platforms rather than systems. Or, mm -hmm. I mean, do, do is that how you think about? So I just talk about the, the platform. I talk about Raven, because there's so many systems in Raven that I haven't talked about in, the part in, in this talk. Um, yeah, there's a lot more complexity in there. That's why I think I call it a platform. Koala is probably not a platform. Um, it'd probably be more um, a service. Um, yeah. So, so how do you envisage these things when you're creating them? <coughs> Sorry, do you mean in terms of the architecture or in terms of a... Uh... Yeah, I think it's all about um, <coughs> what's the central piece of a data lake, for example. Um, You've got the place for storage, but then you've got all the other components that fit around it, you know, the ones that ingest, the ones that automate the queries, the ones that do the monitoring. <clears throat> so there's a lot of that. There's also the, how you deploy these services, how do you test it. Um, but you always start at where the data is. So data is like the key for any machine learning. Um, and it's always like, I don't know, it's like the data engineering term. It's not as common, I think, but uh, we need more data engineers, I'd say, in general. Yep. Um, so a part of AWS Lambda uh, are dead letter queues. And mm -hmm. when your event or your Lambda fails, your event goes into a dead letter queue. <coughs> in the architecture that you were showing, mm -hmm. how do you handle failed events when your logic doesn't work with it? So in terms of the, the failed events, yeah, I've not shown the dead letter queue to keep it simple. Um, but what you would do, like, um, so we've got another API for Kingfisher, for example. So we've got dead letter queue coming out. Uh, you keep the messages invisible, you know, for a few minutes or 10 minutes. And then you would have the lander resubscribe to the SQS queue. So, so that you, I want to keep the same lander code for processing messages that worked the first time, but also the ones that have failed. So that's, that's how you solve the problem, basically. But yeah, I don't want to add too much detail. I do want to put dead letter queue in here and talk about that. Anyone else? Uh, sorry, did you get that? Or did that make sense? Yep, cool, thanks. So just uh, thinking back to the diagram where you had, again, uh, the API gateway, cloud IAM, or yep. sorry, IAM and, uh, and Lambda. Yep. Uh, so I attempted to do that kind of thing the other day. Mm -hmm. I was writing a function that was generating magic links for emails, like one-click one sign-in. Seemed yeah. perfect. It was a little function, but um, by the time I started to fiddle with Lambda and the API gateway config, I thought, "Why am I stepping outside of the world of Kubernetes?" And mm. um, you know, just I could write a simple function and, and just deploy it in a Docker container. So, is it? Did you choose that architecture because you saved that much <coughs> on compute? Uh, okay, so or? let's go back in time. Um, <coughs> so when when I when I when we created this architecture, uh, we were on what's known as CIV one. So we, we didn't we had um, microservices and just giving, but they were all like EC two instances and they were running Windows too. So you know as I was doing service already, um, it took us about a year to get a proper Kubernetes cluster running in house. Also, so there was just a couple of people working on it. So there's nothing else was ready really. We've only had Kubernetes probably in a. Oh, yeah, just about a year and a half. 
<coughs> so this predates that. So um, now, now that you do have it, how would you? <coughs> I still like, wouldn't do it because you still got the inbound integration to deal with. Um, and I think, yeah, API gateways pay as you go. Also, uh, you can also enable caching, especially for like these sort of metrics APIs. I can just enable caching. Uh, if you're doing Kubernetes now, I would probably just go straight to Fargate or you know a managed Kubernetes type version, which wasn't available. But before that, it was you know either you go Google or you try and do it in house, which is what most people did. Um, and there's a lot of complexity in managing Kubernetes in house. So this is your your own Docker containers in terms of the networking and you know the connectivity. So it's not like it's not that easy. So we've got like uh, scenarios where we've got pools and there's just one service uh, going a bit crazy. It sort of kills the pool and then it recycles it and then you know sort of gets stuck in a loop. So there's a lot of things like that. But um, yeah, you need a mature DevOps team to have Kubernetes in house. That's the message. Where serverless, we could sort of do this within data science team, two people done, you know. Any more questions? Oh. Last one. <laughs> I mean, how do you and your colleagues keep up to date with all <coughs> the developments? In with development and data science? Uh, mm. For me, like, computer science is just a passion, so, you know, I just do that in my spare time. Along with martial arts and other things, but you know, there's a <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. No, it's um, I think there's a lot of people in industry. Maybe they're not as passionate, so it's more like their day-to-day -day job. But there are those people that it's just a passion. I'd say so. You're just reading about it in the news, um, tech websites. Um, you're just seeing what's being presented at conferences. So that's sort of how you have to keep up to date. Especially when writing a book, you got to be aware of everything. So I sort of started uh, on Twitter in January this year, and that was more to just see what's going on out there, you know, to enrich the book as much as possible, to add as much detail as I can. Um, so yeah, I think it's part of the passion. If it's part of your job, yeah, you've got to read around the industry. Um, machine learning itself and data science is moving really fast also, so there's loads of conferences out there. Um, SlideShare. I'd say for data science, um, there's three changes. I was talking about data, data skills, machine learning skills on Tuesday, so I had a panel. Um, the three things that have changed since I started at Capgemini um, 2004, there's data there. So there is data out there that you can use, public data, government data. Um, there's the knowledge is out there for free. So before you would have to pay a course, you know, I'd have special courses with IBM to get their IBM training. Now it's it's out there, Coursera, you know, you get it for free. And the computing power in the cloud that just allows you to scale out, as well as the GPUs at home if you've got a gaming PC. So, you know, that's some of the things that have changed, I'd say. So, yeah, you can keep up to date if you're passionate. If you're not, then become passionate. <laughs> cool. Thank you.